Good morning, everybody. On the behalf of the International Economic Association, I would like to thank the Royal Economic Society for agreeing on organizing this session, aiming at promoting young scholars born and or living in the developing world. Uh, thanks to, to Danny Rodrigue for promoting the idea and to Adam Seydou for collaborating on the selection of papers. Thanks to David Atkin and Daria Marin for accepting being the discussants of the session. Unfortunately, Daria is with COVID and cannot be with us today. Uh, we wish her a speedy recovery. Then thanks to the speakers too. Uh, you will have 20 minutes, a 20 minutes slot, including five minute discussion. And we will reserve the last 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, then those in the audience interested on in asking any question, please uh, write it as a Q&A. I will be monitoring your question and address them to the speakers at the end of the session. Then Federico Uneus is the first speaker. Federico, you have 20 minutes and I will remind you uh, when five minutes will be lasting. The floor is yours. Great, thanks a lot. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so thanks to the organizers for having our paper in the program and thanks everyone who's joining today to the session. I'm going to talk about spatial production networks and this is joint work with Costa Sarkolagis and Yuhei Miyauchi and given my affiliation to the Central Bank of Chile, the usual disclaimer applies. So the motivation for this project is that a key feature of a modern economy is the ge geographic complexity of production networks. These production networks are fragmented across countries, across regions, and across firms, but the key ingredient is that firms are trading goods and services across these different dimensions of geography. The World Bank recently ha has been sort of showing that these global value chains and making the case that they are crucial for economic success, success both within countries and across countries. And so we want to kind of push this, uh, uh, this research in terms of these two current approaches that are that have been advancing in parallel. On the one hand side, there's the microeconomics of how firms form endogenous production networks, and this has been rising uh, in the last 10 years or so in terms of uh, research. And the second is the macroeconomic conditions uh, uh, that are determined by the production networks, both across countries and across regions within a country. And this is something a bit more old in terms of uh, uh, research, but it has been recently uh, uh, sort of picked up again, um, um, I think in part because of the develop development of new theories that are more tractable and also uh, uh, richer microdata. So this paper will uh, uh, provide a macro theory uh, that is uh, uh, micro-founded uh, with empirics of endogenous spatial production networks. So we'll show how endogenous production network arise from these firm level decisions across countries and regions. And we're going to link, link the micro to the macro and, and show explicitly how to aggregate these micro decisions characterize equilibrium, do counterfactuals, um, 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 evaluate the normative aspects of these theories and so on. And we're gonna look at how macro shocks endogenously shape these networks and look at both aggregate and distributional effects of these shocks. And in particular, we're gonna look at, uh, uh, in the macro side, we're gonna look at the welfare and efficiency properties and the role of the network formation in terms of propagating shocks. And we're gonna focus on uh, uh, both international trade shocks and also infrastructure uh, projects. So more in detail, we're gonna build a microfounded model of spatial production network that is very tractable in terms of how it's aggregated. Uh, uh, in terms of space, we're gonna think about regions within a country uh, and also trade between different countries. Firms will search and match with suppliers and buyers and form these production networks. And we're going to combine the model with administrative firm to firm data, transaction data from Chile. We're going to establish positive and normative properties of the equilibrium. So we're going to study gravity equation of trade flows in extensive and also the intensive margin. We're going to provide conditions for uniqueness, uh, uh, the data requirements that we need to do counterfactuals uh, uh, and characterize the welfare effects uh, of, of, of different shocks. And then we're going to go into the quantitative analysis where we sort of, this is kind of work in progress, but we're going to look at how search and matching friction elasticities are uh, different from different margins of, 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 of trade flows, but we're going to show that they're really uh, very relevant to sort of under, understand the heterogeneity of these trade flows. 
and they're going to show how endogenous networks are going to amplify aggregate welfare gains from international trade and also a, a gains from infrastructure projects. I'm not going to have so much time to talk about the quantitative analysis. So I'm going to focus on the empirical part and also the normative and, and uh, mostly normative properties of the of the model. Okay, so in terms of the literature, I already mentioned that the paper is connected to both the macro and the micro of production networks. Uh, there's a recent literature on endogenous production network in space, which I think is kind of the closest one to our paper. There are a couple of papers here, but this is kind of really rising in the last couple of years. And we're gonna provide, relative to this literature, we're gonna provide a very tractable a model that can be speak to both the micro data and the uh, aggregate data, and it's gonna be very flexible. Uh, we're gonna connect to the micro-founded gravity trade models and sufficient statistics approach and show you how our model is gonna depart from those, uh, if from this literature. Uh, and then naturally it's gonna be related to the propagation of shocks in production network. And we're gonna show how the endogeneity of the production network is gonna be important in terms of how shocks propagate and our mechanism, our model of formation of, of, of network is gonna be a model of search and matching friction. So we're gonna connect also to this uh, literature. Okay, so um, I'll speak briefly about the data and then I'll go to the motivating facts then the model, the aggregation and equilibrium, and then theoretical analysis. And if we have some time, we can talk a bit about the quantitative analysis that it's still a work in progress. Okay, so in terms of the data, we're gonna use domestic front to front transaction level data set from Chile. This is collected by the Chilean IRS uh, for value tax uh, collection purposes. It's gonna cover domestic trade between all firms in Chile during 20, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2003 and 2022. Um, but we're going to focus on the latest period from 2018, which has a better coverage of the firm from a transaction. It's just the data is much richer on, that, on, on, on those years. The data is going to include both the seller and buyer firm identities, the dates of the transaction, the total amounts, and the origin and destination location at the municipality level. And just to give you a sense, there are 345 municipalities in Chile. Uh, and this is going to have, I mean, this is going to be the information we have for all the transactions in this firm-to-firm -firm, uh, relationships. We're going to combine this data set with other more standard firm-level data sets, such as the custom data that's going to give us information on imports and exports, uh, firm balance sheet characteristics that's going to give us information about total sales, and match employee-employee data set, which is going to give us information on employment and wages. Okay, so just to give you an idea of Chile and also the domestic network in Chile. So this is Chile or horizontally, you know, if I were to put it vertically, it would be kind of very small because it's a very long country. So it goes, you know, if you put it on top of the US, it goes from San Francisco to New York roughly, or in, in Europe, it covers, basically covers full of Europe if you put it diagonally. Um, and, and, and so here, these dots are the municipalities, the 345 municipalities. Uh, the size of the dots is the size of the population of these municipalities. And uh, um, uh, uh, the lines between these dots are the uh, uh, trade, the domestic trade that we see from the data. Uh, uh, and we also show kind of the intensity in terms of how much trade flows there are uh, between different municipalities. But you'll see kind of this just to give you an idea of how the data is, is sort of distributed across space in, in the Chile, in Chile's geography. Okay, so the first fact I want to show is how the uh, number of links relate to both geographic characteristics and also firm characteristics. So here on the left hand side, I'm plotting the average number of links that firms have in each location. So each uh, square or circle is going to be a location projected on the population density. So the population per square, uh, square kilometer. You see that both in terms of linkages with suppliers and buyers, there's a positive correlation. And then on the right hand side, you have on the y axis also the number of links. And on the x axis, you have the total size of the firm in terms of sales. Uh, and this is a log scale. You can see also that there's a positive correlation for both suppliers and buyers. And what's kind of interesting is that the slope of, these, of this correlation is, 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 is the same on both margins, but the levels are different uh, given by the sort of concentration of number of links that there are on suppliers versus buyer side. So all I wanna make a claim here is that the number of links that firms have is connected to both firm size and also the geographic location of the firm. So both those characteristics will be important and we're gonna to touch back on this on, on the when we go to the model. 
The second fact I want to show is how the intensive and the extensive margin relate to distance. So we're going to run very simple regression, bilateral regression on a, 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 the sort of a, a bilateral municipality level regressions of trade flows. We're going to project this on measures of distance. So you'll see that you can see that if you project the total flows of these domestic flows on log distance between municipalities, you're going to find a negative and significant correlation, a bit larger maybe than the center, but still sort of the ballpark. If you, if you, this is sort of kilometer distance. If, if, if you use time travel instead, you're going to get sort of a similar idea, a similar result. And you can decompose the total flows both in terms of the intensive margin, that is the volume per relationship, and the extensive margin, which is the number of relationships in these, in these transactions. And you can see that the intensive and the extensive margin decay in distance at a different rate. In particular, the, uh, the slope of distance is, kind of, is, is going to be larger for the extensive margin than the intensive module. Um, again, we're going to connect this back to the model now. OK, so let me go to the, to the model. So space is going to be partitioned by a finite number of locations. There's going to be a continuum of workers of measure LI. There are going to be two types of goods, intermediate goods and final goods. And the ones that we're going to focus on is, are the intermediate goods are going to be traded across locations subject to an iceberg trade cost, a standard iceberg trade cost. And firms will reach final consumers and buy and supply intermediate goods to other firms. And firms will be heterogeneous in productivity C, which is going to have a follow on exogenous distribution that's going to be heterogeneous across locations. So just going to give you a sketch of, the, of, 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 of how the mechanics of the production network formation works. So it's going to be a certain matching model between firms. Imagine there are three different locations. There are firms in each of these locations. And let's say that this blue location is sort of location that connects with final customers, which is sort of this person here. So firms will be posting ads, both for reaching buyers, this is NB, and for reaching suppliers, this is NS. And then all these posting of ads are gonna be aggregated with an aggregate matching function, which is gonna define the matching rates, both for suppliers and buyers, they're gonna be generated in equilibrium. And given these matching rates and the ads that firms buy, firms will be able to create links with other firms in different locations. Also, we'll have a firms posting ads locally, but there's not going to be any friction there. So as many ads they post, it's going to be transformed in terms of links with consumers. In terms of the math, uh, uh, firms will be uh, 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 um, obtaining profits from reaching cost, uh, consumers, final consumers. They'll uh, get profits from reaching a, a buyer. So here you can see sort of the number of ads and also the matching rates that they'll have in equilibrium. Um, and they uh, uh, will face a search cost that will be sort of have two components. One is sort of the slope of this cost or so the convexity of this cost, which is going to be governed by this gamma parameter, both on buyer side and seller side. And there's going to be a shifter, a fixed cost shifter, that's going to be sort of shifting the number, the cost of the number of ads the firms is, is posting. Um, so these are going to be important parameters, both this F shifter and the slope uh, gamma. So given this, we can show that the number of ads that firms will post, say here, the number of buy, uh, ads to buyers and ads to sellers, we sort of follow the structure that you can separate this into a component that is bilateral in terms of location. It's going to be a function of search and iceberg cost and demand shifter. So basically, it's going to be a function of geography, but then it's also going to be a function of a, a productivity of the firm. So this sort of connects back to fact one, in which we show that the number of links is related to both geography and a, a firm size. OK, let me go to aggregation and general equilibrium. So we can show in this model that the gravity equation of aggregate trade flow sort of connecting back to fact two, we can show that the total number of successful relationship, that is the extensive margin from U to D, so from an upstream location to a downstream location, can be decomposed into a bilateral component, an origin effect, and a destination effect. And what's important is that the bilateral component of this extensive margin can be decomposed into these F, F shifters that I showed you before. And also it's gonna be a function of this lambda parameters and these lambda parameters will be the parameters that go into the, the matching function, the aggregate matching function. Um, but you know, if you go to the intensive margin, so the transaction volume per relationship 
You can also write down the, uh, the intensive margin in terms of a bilateral component, an origin and a destination component. But what's important for us is that the bilateral component is only going to be a function of the iceberg trade cost. So this is sort of connects to the a, a, a fact two in which we show that there's a different response of the extensive and the intensive margin to trade friction. So you can see that the slope of the intensive margin to trade frictions to so the iceberg trade cost is gonna be just governed by sigma, the, the elasticity of substitution across a, 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 a goods. Whereas on the extensive margin, it's gonna be a function of sigma, but also of these lambda, lambda parameters that are governed by the matching function a, 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 a of links between firms. Um, and in particular, you know, the responses to expert trade cost is gonna be amplified through the endogenous network formation. And this is sort of what we wanna highlight and the, at the end of the day, we wanna show how this amplification through these parameters here that are sort of governed by the matching function procedure uh, uh, is gonna matter in terms of aggregate uh, uh, magnitudes of how shocks propagate. Uh, Federico, uh, you have five minutes. Yeah, 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 that's great. Okay, so given the model, we can show some positive properties so we can characterize sufficient conditions for uniqueness. In particular, we need that the substitutabilities in the models are greater than the search externalities in order to have uniqueness. Uh, we can characterize sufficient statistics for counterfactual equilibrium. So we can show that if you have import shares, the sort of bilateral trade between locations and export shares, uh, and sort of the same sort of bilateral, but defined with respect to the seller, both within and across countries, you can do the full kind of factual sort of DEK type of kind of factual as, as, as usual in trade. Uh, um, we can characterize that in this particular case with exogenous production network, that is in which the parameters of the matching function are equal to zero. So there are no sort of uh, frictions in practice. Uh, uh, I mean, there are frictions, there are kind of more extreme frictions in the sense that the network cannot adjust on the extensive margin. If you have that model, uh, you can you can sort of go back to your standard gravity trade models with, with roundabout production, you know, Eton Corton, Alvarez Lucas, Calendon Parro, and so on. Uh, uh, so, so, so in that sense, you can move easily from the previous literature to our model, just moving a couple of parameters. And then we can uh, show some normative properties. So we, we show that the welfare of each location a, a sort of changes to shock can be sort of written into sort of this usual ACR type of formula in which this is going to be a function of the changes in the own import share. Uh, but also what's new in our model is that it's also going to be a function of the change in the number of linkages that uh, uh, firms have within their location. So again, if you shut down the extensive margin, the, the endogenous response of the extensive margin, so lambda is equal to zero, then you'll have that this m, m, bar, m, m hat is gonna be equal to one. So the extensive margin is not adjusting. And then you're sort of back to your standard gravity trade models and the predictions of the ACR model. Um, so this m, m hat is gonna capture the variety effect of domestic suppliers and how adjusting the links uh, between firms is gonna be important for the welfare effect of a particular trade shock. Um, we'll, uh, uh, the Third part of the paper sort of showing how important this is quantitatively. Uh, I'm not gonna show you this today, but I just want to show you sort of the theoretical predictions that the model has. And then finally, let me finish with this. Uh, um, we can also sort of connect our results to sort of the Baquet and Fari type of analysis in terms of thinking about how to a first order, how uh, uh, shocks propagate in the economy. And you know, if you think uh, of a standardized per trade cost, sort of shocking these towels, the first order effect to the world GDP is gonna be given by, first of all, a technological effect. So this is sort of the direct effect um, 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 that sort of kind of like a Holton type of a, 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 a prediction. So this is gonna be just weighting the shocks by the Domar weights. This side will be the, the standard Domar weights. But then in the context of our model with endogenous network effect, you'll find that the adjustment of the number of links that a locations have with one another is gonna be important for predicting the, the effect of trade shocks on world GDP. And in particular, again, you're gonna have the weight will be the Domar weight, which is sort of the share of spending of I, J2I nominal world GDP, but it's gonna be sort of mediated also by how the number of links between locations is, is adjusting. And there, are, and there, you know, we show that the sigma elasticity substitution is very important for governing 
the effect of, of the, the adjustment of the extensive margin on uh, world GDP. So again, we're sort of extending the whole thing on approximation at with some burst in Bakay and Fadi to a model where we have endogenous production uh, networks. Okay, and we can also further decompose this adjustment on the extensive margin on a, a search externalities that the model has, and also your kind of more standard terms of trade reallocation with the endogenous network, given sort of all this logic of, of Bakir and Fadi, in which we're sort of in a second best world due to these matching, search and matching frictions that postures for unfoldance theory. Okay, but in the interest of time, let me finish. Uh, we have some extensions with multiple sector mobility, population mobility, and also the quantitative analysis, which is sort of work in progress, but in the interest of time, let me finish here. We analyze the organization of endogenous production network in space. We develop a micro-funded model of production network formation and apply the model to firms domestic and foreign transactions from Chile and show that the endogenous network formation amplified trade frictions and welfare gains from international trade shocks. Thank you very much. I'm happy, I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thanks a lot. Uh, an excellent paper. I, I like it very much. Uh, unfortunately, no questions are popping up. Then uh, I I will thank you very much the participant of the session if they uh, they can with questions. Then, uh, then uh, I already have a one for Federico, but I will ask it at the end as we announced it at the beginning. Uh, let's then move to, to Pamela. Uh, Pamela, the floor is yours. Great. Um, can you all see the slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers for including our paper on the program. Uh, it, it's great to present it in this audience and thanks for everybody uh, uh, the audience, the online audience. This is labor market power, self-employment and development. And this is joint work with Francesco Morio and Monica Morlaco. So a long-standing view in economics is that a competitive labor market is crucial for the benefits of economic growth to be shared by workers as much as they are by firms. Unfortunately, uh, there is recent evidence, especially coming from developed countries, that we are far from this scenario, uh, that in fact, there is labor market power. Uh, we, might, we know much less uh, if this is the case for developing yeah. economies. Yeah. And you might think, sorry, there is, and uh, you might think, do you hear, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, there, there is some noise in there. There is some noise, sorry. Yeah. I think our Zoom host is, uh, um, okay. Um, <laughs> this is what happens okay. in Zoom. Um, I cannot mute it. I cannot, uh, one second. I'm trying to, but I cannot mute it. Okay. Well, let, let me continue. Um, so, okay, um, okay. great. <laughs> so, well, um, we know much less if this is the case for, for developing economies. And, and this is um, particularly important because if you think about developing economies, in governments in developing economies are the ones who are trying to push these industrial policies that uh, on the one hand are trying to achieve economic growth and productivity growth, but at the same time, they are trying to leave their population out of poverty. Uh, and this is not that easy, we think, that just like bring the evidence that we have for developed countries and or the empirical evidence or the frameworks that we have to study labor market power in developed countries, because uh, labor markets in low income countries are substantially different than those of high income ones in ways, uh, and we're gonna propose that might shape our understanding as well as measurement of labor market power. So what are these ways? So the first one is that we are going in, in low-income countries, we have huge barriers to firm growth, um, fixed costs, entry costs, lower industry productivity that might like lead to higher employee concentration, which has been like linked to labor market power. And second, and I think this is one we wanna push in this paper, um, a feature of low-income countries is that they are characterized by huge self-employment sector. And this is a sort of like very common sector, unregulated and easily accessible sector for workers that want to move away from wage employment. So this is not your entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, uh, just to be clear. This is somebody that opens a shop in their own uh, house or it's like informally being like producing manufacturing goods. Um, this uh, existence of self-employment, well, I'm gonna show you in a bit, 
creates an upward slope in labor supply for firms in the wage employment that is a necessary condition as well for market power to be exerted. So what we want to do in this paper is sort of like uh, put, out, put out a framework to understand labor market power in developing countries, pushing like or putting at the center the role of self-employment. And uh, we're going to show you how it measures, it, it uh, shapes the measurement and understanding. And also it can lead to important policy implications when we're thinking about policies that, that try to build a, a, a much higher uh, wage employment set. So how are we gonna do this? It's an empirical paper. So we're gonna go to a particular case of Peru between 2004, 2011. We're gonna combine uh, farm level data with household level data. So trying to, to, to bridge like two sources of labor market power. And the first thing that we're gonna show you is some stylized facts that sort of like point out or motivate us to think about, we need to think carefully about what is the role of self-employment. So we're going to document, and I'm telling you this in a bit, that there is higher employer concentration that coexists with a large active informal self-employment sector. But these things are not like together in a vacuum, but there is a systematic relationship between the two that uh, it's sort of like in informative or might lead us uh, that, to think that they are related to labor market power. So these uh, facts are going to inform us because uh, to, to build a general equilibrium model where we are going to explicitly uh, have workers sort into wage employment versus self-employment, such that labor market power is going to be determined by two sources now. Um, first, we're going to have the small number of firms competing for labor. So this is your strategic interactions that it feature also in work in developed countries. But second, um, we are also going to uh, see that worker sorting between the wage employment and the self-employment endogenously uh, um, um, create this labor supply elasticity that's going to have interesting uh, effects um, that we haven't seen before. And finally, we are also going to add uh, free entry into this model because we want to think about the, the, the impact of policies. And in order to understand concentration, we also need to, to tackle entry. The model theoretically is going to give us some insights, and then we're going to calibrate the model using the stylus facts um, that discipline the model to, to tell you some uh, empirical implications. So the biggest theoretical implications of the model is that now we are not going to have a one-to-one -one relationship between concentration and labor market power. So increasing concentration does not necessarily lead to an increase in labor market power because sorting might oppose the strategic interaction channel. This is going to be uh, finally an empirical question: how much it opposes, if it's completely this, the, like just uh, unravels it. Um, so we're going to go and then calibrate the model to the data, and we're going to find that sorting, in fact, weakens the response of labor market power to aggregate shocks, which tell us a little bit about um, how rent sharing is going to be impacted by aggregate shocks. And then. Uh, we're going to show you because we don't have a one-to-one -one relationship between concentration and labor market power. So the result of policies that try to sort of like increase the size of wage employment, which has a lot of policy in developing countries and, and, and thus want to reduce concentration, will have different effects on labor market power as well as other labor market outcomes, depending on how they impact the uh, worker sorting between self-employment and wage employment. So that's sort of like a gist of the paper. I'm not going to go into the literature uh, in the interest of time. So I'm just right uh, going to go into our stylus facts. So we're going to bridge uh, data from uh, this. We have data from Peruvian firms as well as data on Peruvian households um, that we use in order to, to give you this stylus fact. So the first one is something that um, we sort of like suspected, but it's good to, to now see it. There is high levels of concentration among formal manufacturing employers. And this is not trivial. Uh, this is much larger than what people have found, for instance, for the US. Just to give you an idea, we have a local labor market defined by an industry uh, geographic pair. And 52% of the market in Peru have a higher final index based on a wage bill of 95 or more. So this is a very, very concentrated local labor markets. Uh, and these are not tiny rural areas that you may think, okay, nobody lives there. There is only one firm, but there is only like 10 people. Like 12% of the manufacturing formal employment is concentrated in this very high concentrated local labor market. So they do account for, uh, for, for the aggregates. 
these uh, high concentrated uh, local labor markets coexist with high uh, um, with local labor markets with high self employment rates in these manufacturing industries. Again, just to give you an idea, 43% uh, of these local labor markets have 80% uh, 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 of their total employment in the self employment sector. This is a huge. And again, what is the self employment sector? This is a very informal self employment sector, uh, very easily accessible. Just to give you an idea again, the transition rates between the wage employment and the self-employment, the yearly transition rates are around 20%. So people are indeed actively moving from the wage employment to the self-employment within a very narrowly defined manufacturing industry. And these two things do not coexist in, in, uh, alone, uh, but they do have a relationship. And we use here um, uh, trade shock, to understand the relationship between employment concentration and uh, labor market outcomes. Um, and we find that employment concentration among formal employers, it's negatively related to the average earnings in wage employment, which is sort of like an indication of, oh, there might be some labor market power there. But this also permeates to the self-employment sector. We see that there is also a negative relationship with the average earning on self-employment with a positive relationship with the size of the self-employment sector. And uh, importantly, there is a negative relationship with the average schooling in both sectors. And if you think about schooling being a proxy of abilities, it's sort of like hints to a sorting of workers between these two sectors. So with these three facts, we wanna, we wanna think of, if we wanna think about labor market power, we think we need something that creates this concentration. We need something that sort of like explain this, uh, takes into account the self-employment, takes into account this sorting. So that's exactly what we're going to, the ingredients we're going to put in our model. So our model is going to have a continuous local labor market. So they are going to be indexed by K. Uh, in each of these local labor markets, we have individuals that are going to consume a bundle of what we call market or industry level goods, CK. Each of these industrial goods is going to come in two varieties. One variety is CM here, which is going to be produced by a finite number of formal firms. And then a variety CS, which is going to be produced by self-employed workers. Okay, so here you should think about: I want, I am a consumer. I want to buy a pair of tennis shoes. I have the option to buy a pair of tennis shoes from Nike, or I have to buy, uh, uh, or the option to buy a tennis shoes from uh, Pamela's. Okay, we're going to have a very simple demand: a couple of glass over all these market-level goods, and CS over these two varieties of, of the market-level goods. This is our. our uh, baseline specification, so it's just as uh, simple as possible. We're going to have perfect competition in the goods market, um, and we're going to have strategic interaction, how a current competition in the local labor market. Uh, how is labor supply? So um, labor uh, workers are going to be choosing between wage work, which is sector M, the formal employment, or the informal self-employment sector S. They are gonna be born with their genius abilities or skills in both sectors that are governed by this uh, distribution function G, okay? Um, workers, of course, are gonna choose so a la Roy to work in the formal sector if the earnings that they get working there are greater than the earnings that they get uh, working on the self-employment. And we have this W hat, which is a ratio of uh, um, wages between the formal and self-employment informal sector per efficiency unit of labor. This uh, sorting is going to provide with some effective aggregate labor supply for firms in the manufacturing formal sector. And of course, we're going to have an elasticity from this labor supply, and it's going to be strictly positive. So this is your upward sloping labor supply, which is coming from the sorting of workers between the formal and informal sector. It's endogenous uh, form um, labor supply elasticity. On the production side, self-employed workers are very simple, just a linear production function. And formal firms in the wage employment, again, this is the simplest uh, case, we're gonna assume for, for now that they are homogeneous and this, this, we, can be relax, we can relax that. There is some market level productivity shifter, Z, K, right? So think about something that um, maybe the government can uh, change or like the profitability uh, aggregate. Um, such that total supply of the good of the manufacturing formal sector uh, takes this form. This uh, number of in, uh, integer number of firms are going to be determined by a pre entry problem where firms have to pay some fixed costs in final good units. 
this, we solve this problem of the firm and we're gonna get our usual um, uh, markdown specification where wage uh, is gonna be a markdown below marginal revenue product of labor. And this side here is your markdown, which in our case, uh, it's very simple, but it reveals the two sources that shape labor market power. So on the one hand, on the one hand you have this upward stopping labor supply here which is completely shaped endogenously determined by the sorting of workers between the two sectors. And then you have here, because we have homogeneous uh, firms, this number of firms, M here, which is basically tied to a strategic interaction channel and labor market concentration. If we have heterogeneous firms, yes, five minutes. Yeah, you have, you have five minutes, yeah. Perfect. So this will be uh, yeah, the share of the firm in the market. So one thing that the, the model, uh, theoretically the model tells you is that now there is no a one-to-one -one relationship between concentration and labor market power. So you have now, yes, a direct effect between the number of firms and size, the measure of labor market power. But there is also an indirect effect that is coming from the endogenously um, uh, created labor supply elasticity. Okay. This is a priori theoretically ambiguous. So effectively the uh, indirect effect, the change in labor supply elasticity might oppose um, uh, totally the effect of a strategic interactions such that we uh, labor market power might be uh, in the opposite direction. So this is the first insight. Of course, we need to see that in the data. So what we do is we take the model, we calibrate the model using as moments, the first uh, style, set of style effects that, that I show you. And, and what do we do? Uh, the first question that we want to answer is basically, okay, uh, what will happen if how much of the change in labor market power after some exogenous profitability or productivity shock is due to sorting? Right? So how much sorting shapes the response of uh, labor market power to shock, to aggregate shocks? Why do we care about this? Because this is the size, uh, the change in size is actually what is going to govern the pass-through of aggregate shocks to wages, which is sort of like a rent sharing parameter. Um, so what you see here on the left is the changes in uh, this productivity shock, exogenous changes in productivity shock, and on the y-axis you have the changes in this labor market power. The uh, solid line is the overall effect when you have sorting and strategic interactions, and the dashed line is when we take away sorting, it's just a strategic interaction. So first, the first thing that you see is that just having sorting uh, softened uh, the effect of aggregate shocks into labor market power. Um, so the effect of productivity, in particular, the effect of productivity shock on labor market power could be a twice as large um, without sorting. This is meaningful uh, quantities. But I think the way that it, it, it changes it, it's, it's interesting in itself. So it, think about you have a negative pro productivity or profitability shock, so like an import competition shock, right? Um, what would have happened uh, basically if you didn't have sorting, uh, if you didn't have sorting, that is the dash line. So labor market power, because the firms are exiting the market, concentration is increasing, labor market power would have increased much more, in particular double uh, at some point without sorting. So sorting for negative profitability shock as like having the self-employment indeed as, as a buffer for uh, workers to the negative effect of uh, import competition shocks if we have a labor market power in this economy. We also do um, another exercise, and I'm just gonna go very quickly. So we have different policy targets in the model. So you have free centric costs, you have disaggregate profit, uh, productivity shocks, and also you have the abilities of workers that could have been uh, uh, tried. Uh, there is an attempt to, to change them through these training programs to the youth to go from the informal to the formal sector. And I just wanna show you that if you change all these para parameters to sort of like achieve the same decrease in uh, concentration measured by this HHI, um, as you can see here on the top right panel, the effects on labor market power are gonna be uh, quite different depending on what parameter you are targeting. And it depends, every parameter is gonna shape sorting in a different way. And that's sort of like the, the the differences, um, uh, the source of the difference that we're going to find. And this is going to permeate to earnings of wage and self-employment, as well as the size of self-employment. So that's, that's, that's going to create totally different outcomes. 
So I just want to conclude what we want to do in this paper is to understand labor market power in low-income countries. In order to do that, we think that we do need to take into account the features of this low uh, labor market, uh, labor markets, especially the sorting into the self-employment sector. We build a model to include that, and we show that sorting indeed shapes uh, the link between concentration and labor market power, and it has implications, quantitative implications for rent sharing and, and industrial policy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, very, very interesting paper. Uh, then let's uh, move to the, uh, to the following one. Uh, it is uh, Kaliani. Uh, yeah. Kaliani, the floor is yours. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, yeah. Okay. Then you, you have 15 minutes, right? Okay. Uh, I yeah. will tell you when five minutes will be remaining. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work in this forum. Uh, my paper is titled Size-Based Regulations, Why Bunching Can Be Misleading. So as the title suggests, the focus of my paper is on size-based labor market regulations. These are government policies that impose a wedge between the wage rate and the actual labor cost of firms after firms employ more than a threshold number of workers. So regulations such as these are prevalent around the world, for instance, as a US Affordable Care Act, which require firms with more than 50 workers to pay a tax penalty if they do not give health insurance to all its employees. Or there are French labor market regulations that require French firms with more than 50 workers to provide minimum wages, health and safety benefits and job securities to workers. So rules such as these would encourage firms to stay small if the associated compliance costs are large. And this would raise several important questions from a policy perspective. So in particular, it's necessary to understand how large are these compliance costs for firms? What is the extent of distortions induced by these rules on firms? And what are the aggregate productivity consequences of these rules? So in my paper, I offer a new approach to answer these questions. So existing work analyzes the impact of these rules on firms by exclusively focusing on a single metric, which is the magnitude of bunching by firms at the regulatory cutoff. So since these rules bind only above a cutoff level of an endogenously chosen variable like employment, the argument is that firms can avoid falling under their purview by choosing a level of employment that's just at the cutoff. So previous work implies that the more bunching there is at the cutoff, the more binding the regulation is. So this is an example of the French, so this is the French firm size distribution, and this is an example of a firm size distribution that exhibits bunching. So as I said, uh, France has size-based labor market regulations that hit firms after they employ more than 50 workers. And as you can see in the French firm size distribution, there are too many firms that employ exactly 50 workers, and there are too few firms that employ to the right of 50 workers. So in my paper, I depart from this line of thought in three main directions. First, I show that size-based rules can be extremely restrictive for establishments without causing bunching at the threshold. Second, by exploiting a policy change in India that led to an exogenous variation in costs imposed by a size-based legislation on establishments, I argue that a more fruitful way to evaluate these rules would be to look at their impact on transitions across the relevant cutoffs. And third, I develop a quantitative framework to understand the mechanisms through which these rules induce distortions, to understand why the exclusive focus on bunching to identify these costs can be misleading, and also to quantify the aggregate productivity consequences of these rules. So in the interest of time, I'll be taking you over all these three parts very quickly. So my paper belongs to the broad literature on misallocation of resources in developing countries. So in particular, I am focusing on a specific tool that can be used by policymakers to reduce misallocation, which is size-based labor market regulations. And as I have already discussed, I identify regulatory costs by focusing on transitions around the threshold. The second broad uh, literature that my paper fits in is that my quantitative framework is related to the models on labor search with multi-worker firms, and it's also related to the models on network formation in international trade. 
Okay, so I built my arguments using the Indian Employment Protection Legislation. Now, the Indian Employment Protection Legislation requires manufacturing establishments with more than 100 formal workers to obtain government authorization and to provide severance pay before they can fire even one formal worker. So anecdotal evidence suggests that establishment owners face considerable delays in securing government authorization, thereby increasing the uncertainty that they face during an adverse shock. So I interpret this as increasing the firing cost of establishments after they employ more than 100 formal workers. The second source of cost is as follows. So labor regulations in India are enforced through frequent inspections of factory premises by government officials. These inspections take a lot of time and effort and there's a lot of corruption associated with these inspections. So I interpret this as increasing the marginal cost of production of establishments after they employ more than 100 formal workers because these are incurred not just during adverse shocks and the amount of bribe that establishments pay typically scale up with the number of workers. Now, it's a well-established fact that there is no evidence of bunching at 100 workers in the Indian establishment size distribution. So the Indian establishment size distribution looks as follows. There is formal employment on the x-axis and the density of firms on the y-axis. The relevant threshold is 100 workers. And as you can see, there's nothing going on at the 100 worker threshold in the Indian establishment size distribution. Despite this lack of bunching, this legislation could still be costly for establishments. So intuitively, think of the cutoff level of employment as a toll gate on the highway that charges a lot during certain hours of the day. So if you have a lot to lose from waiting, you're gonna cross no matter what and pay the regulatory, pay the high toll charges. On the other hand, if your opportunity cost of time is not that high, then you're going to respond to these high toll charges by slowing down in general. Analogously, I expect establishments that are way below the threshold to slow down their hiring in response to these costly size-based rules. As a result, what these costly size-based rules are doing is that it increases the time that firms take to cross the cutoff number of workers. So this gets captured in the data as a decrease in the probability with which establishments transition from below the threshold to above the threshold within a given time horizon. So a series of policy reforms that were implemented in several Indian states starting from 2014 allows me to establish a causal relationship between this legislation and establishment level outcomes. So more specifically, starting from 2014, eight Indian states to increase the threshold for the applicability of this legislation from 100 formal workers to 300 formal workers. So this can be interpreted as a variation in regulatory costs that these establishments faced in the treated states. So using data on Indian manufacturing establishments linked over time over a 20 year period, starting from 1998 till 2018, and I also exploit the staggered implementation of this policy across Indian states. And in response to this, I find that establishments in the treated states are significantly more likely to transition from below 100 formal workers to above 100 formal workers after the policy reform relative to the counterfactual. Keep in mind that 100 formal workers is the old regulatory threshold. The second finding is that the establishments in the treated states are significantly less likely to transition from below 300 formal workers to above 300 formal workers after the reform when compared to before. And 300 is the new regulatory threshold. And there is no statistically significant impact of the policy reform on transition probabilities of establishments around any other threshold. I also look at whether this policy reform had an impact on the substitution pattern of establishments. So in particular, I consider if the policy change had Im impacted the substitution patterns of establishments with capital goods and contractual workers. So contractual workers can be roughly interpreted as informal workers. So they are part-time employees of the establishment. They are paid much lesser than formal workers and they do not follow the they do not fall under the purview of this regulation. 
So I implement a similar staggered difference in difference framework. And I find that the capital labor ratio and the contractual labor intake by establishments that were previously around the neighborhood of the 100 worker threshold have decreased significantly after the policy change. And these outcome variables have increased significantly after the policy change as establishments approach the new threshold of 300 workers in the treated states. And as before, there is no statistically significant change in these outcome variables for establishments that were previously around any other threshold. Okay, so, Yanni, you have five minutes. Okay, so I'll quickly go over the model. So uh, the above, so in, in so far, whatever I've discussed, I haven't said anything about why the Indian employment protection legislation does not cause bunching in the establishment site distribution. Also, from a policy perspective, it's necessary to understand the driver behind these regulatory costs. So in particular, it will be useful to know whether these costs are because of the firing component or because of the corruption that's there in the enforcement of these regulations. And from a misallocation perspective, it's necessary to understand the aggregate productivity consequences of the regulation. So my model has roughly some key building blocks, which is very standard in literature. So my model comprises of forward-looking establishments with productivity levels that evolve over time according to an onstein uhlenbeck process. The production function exhibits decreasing returns to scale and the op establishments operate with three factors of production, formal workers, contract workers, and capital goods. These three factors of production are considered to be imperfect substitutes in the production process. I assume that contract workers and capital can be adjusted, adjusted instantaneously without any cost. So they are static inputs in the production process. However, adjusting the number of formal workers have hiring and firing costs. So hiring formal workers is time consuming. Hiring requires effort by the establishment. More effort means as workers will come to work for the establishment faster on average but establishments cannot always choose high levels of search because there are convex costs associated with it. And there is a convexity parameter which determines the sensitivity of an establishment search effort to its expected marginal benefit from search. Now, firing formal workers is also costly in my model. So I assume that every employed formal worker can quit the establishment at a natural rate. And on top of that, if an establishment wants to fire a formal worker, then establishments can choose a larger separation rate. So if they choose a larger value of the separation rate, the faster will formal workers leave the establishment on average. But they cannot always choose high separation levels because there are convex costs associated with it. So this is how I incorporate firing costs in my model. So convex costs associated with hiring and firing imply that establishments can adjust their formal employment only over time and not instantaneously. So given productivity and the number of formal workers that they have, establishments choose the surge effort and the firing rate that maximizes the discounted present value of their lifetime profits. And the optimal surge effort and the optimal firing rate is chosen in such a way that the marginal cost of that action is equal to the expected marginal benefits from that action. Okay, so what does my model predict? My model has roughly two predictions. So first is, with a size-based regulation such as the Indian Employment Protection Legislation that increases the marginal cost of production of formal workers and that increases the firing cost of production, that increases the firing cost of formal workers after, in, after establishments employ more than 100 workers. So in the presence of such a regulation, my model predicts that as establishments approach the regulatory threshold, their increase in the present value of profits from having more workers is smaller. As a result, given their marginal cost of search, they put in lower search when compared to the case with no regulation. So as a result, establishments are more likely to spend in spend more time on average in their respective states. And when they receive a shock, it's more like it's less likely that they move forward. So uh, larger the magnitude of regulatory costs, larger will be the decline in search effort and smaller will be the transition probabilities from below 100 workers to above 100 workers. So this is consistent with my reduced form evidence. The second prediction is that 
in my based on my model, the steady state distribution may or may not exhibit bunching, and this depends on the marginal adjustment cost of search. So consider establishments that approach the regulatory threshold of 100 formal workers. They slow down their search. So with a high separation rate of workers, what's going to happen with this slowing down is that establishments are more likely to fall back. Establishments are more likely to lose workers instead of gaining workers. Now, if the marginal adjustment cost of search is low, then establishments will be able to adjust their search intensity in response to these exogen, in response to workers leaving. How, so as a result, they can get back to being around 100 formal workers. And this is what is called as bunching. This is what we see as bunching in the steady state distribution. On the other hand, if the marginal adjustment cost of search is high, then establishments will not be able to adjust their surge intensity much in response to exogenous shocks. So as a result, they're going to stay below 100 formal workers and they're not going to replace their lost workers quickly. So this will manifest in the firm size distribution, not as bunching at the threshold, but it will be spread out below the threshold, which is what we see in the Indian data. Now, in the, try yeah. to conclude. Please. Yeah, sorry. So this is my slide. So in order to quantify the magnitude of regulatory costs, I fit this model to establishments in the treated states. I assume that in the data, the establishment size distribution in the treated states from 2011 until the reform is in steady state. Uh, the, the reduced form regression that I showed, the reduced form regression that I have is informative about how transition probabilities of establishments respond and how substitution patterns of establishments respond once the regulatory threshold is changed. Similarly, in my model, different values of regulatory costs and different policy invariant parameters correspond to different steady state distributions uh, in the treated states. And it also produces different establishment size transitions around the threshold and different substitution patterns around the threshold. And the I'm using simulated method of moments procedure to pin down the parameters in such a way that the model matches closely with their respective empirical counterparts. So yes, so this is this is all that I have. Uh, I have I, I'm yet I'm still working on the estimation strategy, and once I get the parameter estimates, the goal is to calculate the aggregate productivity consequence with the regulation. Thank you very much, Kalyani. It's a very very interesting paper, uh, David. Sorry, I thought that uh, we were going to do both both papers and then discussion. Ah, I'm sorry. Then, uh, if you prefer, then we do the second paper and you make a common discussion at the end. I think that'll be quicker. I don't know. I have all the slides together. So. Okay. Okay. Then, then uh, let's do this way. Then the follower speaker is uh, Kanika. Uh, Kanika, mm -hmm. can you share your uh, please? Thanks, Omar. Uh, I hope my screen is visible now. Okay, uh, yes, thank you uh, so much, uh, IA and, uh, and RES, for giving us a chance to present this paper. Um, so this, this is joint work with Ananda Chakravarti and uh, Shekhar Tomar. Uh, and this work is motivated by the literature that has looked at the effect of economic shocks and how it affects both output and trade, and the fact that the effects on output and trade are pretty much different, with the output recovery happening much more earlier than, uh, than trade, which is been referred to as uh, the trade collapse uh, in, in the literature. And one of the examples, one of the more recent examples of the trade collapse was the post-global financial crisis when the international trade contracted more than the global GDP. So in this paper, we look at domestic trade collapse in the context of Kenya, and we try to answer the question as to why this trade collapse occurred. Um, why domestic trade matters? Uh, there is uh, you know, research that shows that intra-country trade costs can be as high as inter-country trade costs, and that's one of the reasons why we were interested in looking at the effect on domestic trade per se. Uh, so how an initial shock, and the shock here we look at is uh, the COVID-19 lockdown that happened in, in India, how it affected domestic trade, and how the firms adjust to it, more importantly. So what leads to this trade collapse, and the specific mechanism that we want to look at in this paper is that of regional realignment, of firms uh, motivated by what was the extent uh, of expansion that they could do uh, in their home markets. So as I said, we're going to look at uh, the COVID-19 national lockdown that happened in India as the exogenous shock uh, to trade costs in this case. Uh, to give you a brief overview, the lockdown happened in India in March 2020, which included a complete restriction on the movement of goods and people in the country. Uh, 
by mid-May, the restrictions had started to ease. By August, uh, there was a complete lift up of restrictions on transportation. And in fact, by September, the economy of India had gone back to its pre-pandemic level in terms of um, uh, you know, the various economic indices. However, what happened to uh, domestic trade in the country? So if one looks at uh, the inter-region sales uh, as a proportion of the intra-region sales uh, in the country in the aggregate, in 2020, uh, year, year on year growth from 2019, it's clearly visible that after the lockdown in March, there was a, there, there was a drastic decline in, in domestic trade, which recovered over a period of time, but never really went back to its pre-pandemic levels. So again, you know, a trade collapse in the context of domestic trade is, is what happened in the country. So in this paper, we first document rigorously the existence, uh, both immediate and persistence of trade collapse, even like months down months after the national lockdown, we explained this trade collapse through the channel of regional realignment. By regional realignment, I mean that plants which were selling more outside uh, their region, so here by a region, I mean a state in India, so India is divided into many administrative states, um, uh, plants which were selling more outside their state or outside their region were the ones who shifted uh, inside their region for, for both sales as well as input sourcing. Now, which were the products which were more likely to undergo realignment? Here, the products where the you know where either the sellers could move inwards or the uh, sources of inputs could source from within their uh, home region were the ones who actually moved inwards post this shock. And in fact, this realignment led to an increase in sales growth uh, and helped firms recover from uh, from the economic shock. We contribute broadly to three strands of literature. One is the literature on trade collapse, and here we add a new channel to it, which is the channel of regional realignment which can lead to persistence in trade collapse after an economic shock. The second literature we contribute to is the supply chain propagations. Uh, and here again, our contribution is similar. We, uh, we, we, we test for a new channel here, which has not been sort of you know, tested by the earlier papers, largely because of lack of data. Uh, when looking at international trade, one generally doesn't have the same level of frequency of uh, data uh, from sourcing in the country or selling in the country. At the same time, in the context of international trade, there are many other channels like protectionism, trade credit, as well as differential changes in demand across countries, which cannot be perfectly controlled. However, in this setting, as I'll show you later, we're able to control for these channels. The data set that we use is the EVA bills uh, data that is collected by the Goods and Services Tax Network in India. Uh, and uh, an EVA bill is required to be generated for transportation of goods above uh, 700 USD. The data uh, period is from January 2019 to December 2020. This system was put in place in April 2018, but the data collection only stabilized by the end of 2018, and hence, uh, you know, we can only look at this particular period. We can only go this much further back into time. There are probably two data sets here that one can use. Uh, one is the plant level data, and the other is the product level data. Uh, on the plant side, there are two data sets, uh, one for inter-region and the other for intra-region. Both these data sets have the top 1,000 plants for every region or state uh, for every month. However, it's possible to match these plants over time as well as across these data sets using a unique identifier. Though these are only top 1,000 plants, but they contribute almost 60% to the total region level sales in the country. We have access to similar data sets on the input side as well. Uh, additionally, we merge these data sets uh, with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs because uh, what this data set doesn't give us is the industry in which the plant operates. Uh, and we're able to match a large proportion of uh, uh, these plants and get their NIC uh, classifications. Uh, for our analysis, uh, we since you know top thousand plants may keep changing from month to month, we, we, we want to uh, control for exit and entry in our analysis. We keep a balanced set of plants of which we have total sales available for all the 24 months uh, in our analysis. Uh, we do the same uh, set of plants on the input side for which total input is available for all the 24 months. So in general, these are large plants and they actually contribute to almost 52% of the sales. So we're not missing out on, uh, missing out on a lot uh, by restricting ourselves to these set of plants. Uh, on the product side, we again have uh, similar data, but here there are three data sets. One is inter-region sales at the product level, at the four-digit level. The other is intra-region or within uh, state sales. Uh, and the third is how much the region is receiving from the other states in aggregate. So what we don't know is from which state it's coming, but what we know is the total aggregate inter-region inter, inter receivables. Here again, the data is for top 1,000 products in every 
month. And we keep a balance set uh, for which total sales, uh, for which uh, total sales is available for all the 24 months. Uh, the first thing we do is we look at the, the uh, patterns in total sales and inputs with time in, in 2020. So what I've plotted here are the double difference estimates, which is essentially the change in a given month in 2020, which is mentioned on the graph vis-a-vis -vis January 2020, as compared to the same change uh, in 2019 for the same month over January uh, 2019. Uh, controlling for form level uh, unobserved heterogeneity, uh, plant level unobserved heterogeneity. Uh, and here, you know, the patterns are similar. We see that there is a drastic fall in total sales, which recovers by September, a drastic fall in total inputs, which recovers by September. However, the domestic trade doesn't recover by uh, September. So there is a drastic fall in, in domestic trade immediately post the lockdown, which remains at a lower level uh, up to the end of 2020. And we observe the same for the inputs as well, uh, uh, that you know, uh, uh, the domestic trade and in inputs also sort of remains lower than the pre-pandemic levels, even towards the end of 2020. Here, I must point out that in 2020, uh, India did not see any other wave of COVID-19. So we were pretty much COVID-free till the end of 2020, and there was no health shock that happened in the country uh, in, in further in that particular year after the lockdown. More importantly, we want to test for the regional realignment, which are these firms basically, which are moving inwards due to which we see the trade collapse uh, uh, in the country. So to test this out, uh, we uh, define the fraction of pre-pandemic inter-regional dependent inter region sales or inputs over total sales in uh, 2019 for both sales as well as inputs. Uh, on average, what we find is that 53% of sales are inter-region for typical plant, uh, and 64% of inputs are sourced from outside the region for, for an average plant. To examine our hypothesis, we uh, regress the outcome variable of uh, log of uh, intra-region sales, inter-region sales, inter-region inputs, and intra-region inputs uh, on uh, an indicator for month and year dummy, which is interacted with the fraction that we've constructed. And this gives us the estimate of gamma 2. We further control for plant level unobserved heterogeneity as well as plant specific month seasonality. In addition to control for the demand changes and the changes in prices, we control for the sector in which the firm operates interacting with the month and year of fixed effects. Uh, X's are the other control variables. Specifically, when we look at the, uh, the sales side, we always control for the input dependence of a particular plant. Similarly, whenever we look at the input side, we always control for the sales dependence of that particular plant. Uh, here, the coefficient of interest, as I mentioned, was gamma two, which basically gives us what's the impact of inter-region sales dependence on plant outcomes in month M in year 2020, vis-a-vis -vis January 2019, over and above the same outcome in the year 20, uh, uh, in the year 2019. So this is with respect to January 2020. So it's essentially plotting heterogeneous uh, difference in difference treatment effects. Uh, so this, uh, so here uh, we plot the effect on inter-region sales in the first graph and on intra-region sales of the second graph. And here I'm plotting the gamma two coefficients. Uh, and what we find is that firms which are more dependent on inter-region sales, uh, their inter-region sales fell more post the lockdown and continues to remain lower than the pre-pandemic level. However, these firms increase their exposure to intra-region sales, you know, after some time has elapsed, so, so, so they've basically diversified and they've moved from inter to uh, to intra-region. Uh, similarly, we look on the input side and we find a similar pattern where the firms who was which were sourcing more inter-region before the pandemic have moved more inwards in terms of sourcing their inputs uh, because their inter-region exposure has declined and their intra-region sourcing has increased. Second, we check. We check the same hypothesis using product level data. Here again, we construct for a given product K in region R and inter-region sales fraction from the pre-pandemic data, which is the proportion of sales of that product that was being sold outside uh, the region before the pandemic. In addition to uh, testing our hypothesis for inter-region dependence, we additionally see which, you know, which other characteristic can, can explain this realignment towards the domestic or towards the home market. And here we construct an entity called scope for home expansion, which is basically exploiting the idea that I can only move in, I can, you know, as, uh, as a producer and, and as a supplier, if I'm selling goods, I can only move inwards into my home region 
if uh, you know I had this excess demand to cater to, if at least before pandemic, some bit of that product was also being sourced from outside the region to begin with. So here we define scope for home expansion as a minima of two entities. One is the inter-region sales fraction. So if a region was not selling anything outside uh, the home region before the pandemic, then the scope for home expansion is zero. Similarly, if the region was not buying any of that product from other regions before the pandemic, and again, uh, the scope for home expansion is zero. When both these fractions are large, that's when the scope for home expansion would also be large for a particular product. Uh, so we estimate a similar specification. Here our outcome variables are, again, inter-region sales, intra-region sales, so product K in region R in month M and E of Y. Uh, the heterogeneity that we want to look at is with respect to the inter-region sales fraction, as well as uh, the scope for home expansion. We control for product region level unobserved heterogeneity, as well as seasonality for every month for that given product in that, in that region. Second, we also control for the overall uh, HSN code level changes in product demand over time, because we don't want demand changes which may be induced by economic changes to affect our estimates. Uh, Additionally, when looking at the sales outcome, we control what was the exposure to inter-region receivables fraction uh, to make sure that our results on inter-region uh, sales fraction are not being uh, convoluted uh, by similar variation on the receivable side. Kanika, you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and the coefficient of interest here are the coefficients pi two, which basically tell us what is the heterogeneous impact on inter-region and intra-region product level sales uh, due to uh, 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 the fractions that I just mentioned. So first we look at the effect of inter-region sales uh, dependence for a product. And we find similar patterns that we found for uh, the plants uh, again, that inter-region sales fall more uh, for products which were more dependent on inter-region sales to begin with. At the same time, intra-region sales increase for these products uh, uh, more as compared to products which were not that dependent uh, on, uh, on inter-region sales. Uh, we find similar patterns using the scope for home expansion variable, but interestingly, for scope for home expansion, we find an immediate effect even during the month of lockdown where um, uh, these products managed to shift from inter to intra-region where it, it was possible for them to make the shift, and then this persisted towards the end of 2020 with some bullwhip effect happening in May, June, where you know uh, you do go back to uh, contracts uh, in the months of May and June, uh, but then it comes back. We conduct a bunch of robustness checks, both at the plant and the product level, uh, uh, in terms of you know using district level variations, trying to get rid of other hypotheses, such as firms' financial conditions, which may explain these patterns that we see. We look at the unbalanced sample, as well as control for regional level variation in the stringency of lockdown over time. Uh, all our results broadly hold. I will not go over them in the in the, in the interest of time. Uh, we importantly also estimate, you know, uh, instead of double difference, we do a first difference estimation, but which allows us to go back and look back into pre-trends much further, just looking uh, rather than just looking at the month of February. And here again, we do this for all the uh, uh, analysis that I showed you so far, and we don't find any uh, uh, pre-trends uh, before uh, the lockdown hit the country. Uh, additionally, what we find is that the scope for home expansion aided the total sales recovery uh, of plants. So uh, here is the total sales, and we find that you know, plants which had a higher scope for home expansion, they, they managed to recover the total sales much early. Let me not go over the product list again in the interest of time and uh, conclude. Uh, so essentially, we've shown that domestic, you know, we've actually documented uh, the domestic uh, domestic trade collapse post an economic shock. This was one of the first papers to do that uh, when it came out last year. Um, and what we find is that regional realignment, which is aided by the scope for home expansion, uh, can be one of the channels which leads to persistence in trade collapse. And we find that this actually aids recovery in total output. But again, we cannot say anything about welfare because uh, given the reduction in variety, consumer welfare can actually fall. So let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, an excellent paper. Uh, then let uh, give the floor to David. Um, great, thank you very much. Hopefully everyone uh, can see my slides. Um, so uh, thank you for a great uh, uh, set of talks um, uh, today uh, for very interesting papers. And 
Um, I'm going to you know, talk briefly about the last two. I guess I'll go in reverse order. So the paper we've just seen uh, at first uh, and uh, make some, um, I guess, a, a fairly broad comments uh, on, um, uh, on the work. Um, so uh, let me just give a kind of brief uh, uh, overview um, uh, of, uh, of, of the paper. So, um, so kind of at, at, at kind of its center is this kind of a, a, a kind of novel trade data. I guess uh, uh, researchers are starting to gain access to it, but this is one of the first papers I've seen where we have this uh, new goods and service tax uh, in India, and this is provided provided a kind of new uh, 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 insight and new ability to kind of track movement of goods. Uh, both within state and across state coming from these uh, goods and service tax uh, receipts. And um, what they're going to do is they're going to use uh, uh, these data to try and uh, think about the impact of these uh, uh, COVID shutdowns and this two month uh, state border restriction between uh, kind of March uh, uh, and May 2020 uh, on both intra uh, and interstate uh, uh, commerce. And kind of at its center is this uh, 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 quite convincing event study where essentially we're looking within a particular product, a particular month, and a particular year, and we're comparing across, you know, firms where there was kind of very limited scope for substitution from inter to intra uh, 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 state trade uh, uh, versus ones where there was lots of substitution, uh, and we'll see kind of very stark differences between uh, uh, how these uh, kind of two types of, of firms or two types of products are, are responded. And kind of the big takeaway here is that there's been this kind of a, a substantial realignment of sourcing. Uh, and sales towards kind of firms and customers uh, in your own uh, 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 state. Uh, and uh, um, uh, to some degree, that's persistent. Uh, it doesn't just uh, kind of fade away uh, uh, once uh, these kind of state border restrictions are, are lifted. And, you know, as uh, Kanika uh, uh, made, out, made, made clear, you know, it's a very nice contribution to both the literature on trade collapses and, and this kind of a, a, more, a smaller literature on thinking about vent for surplus uh, when uh, kind of uh, our firms uh, shift their sales uh, in response uh, to shocks in certain markets. Okay, so, you know, I kind of thought a bit about, you know, what are we uh, uh, kind of really showing here? And, you know, kind of the way I would think about it is, you know, some relationships are expanding, others are, are shrinking, and some new relationships are formed, others are destroyed. And, what we're doing essentially is we kind of have a way of identifying the lucky firms. Who are those? These are the firms who kind of saw a big drop in local competition because all the people uh, are, are, are selling to the markets they were selling to uh, 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 couldn't access those markets because of these border restrictions. Uh, and that drop in local competition was in excess of their loss of sales coming from the fact that they couldn't access markets elsewhere. Okay, so these are kind of the lucky firms who, who have a lot more market locally now and a lot less, uh, and that's uh, increase is much greater than what they lost elsewhere. And so these guys relatively aren't gonna do so badly. Meanwhile, the unlucky firms are the ones who the opposite's true, which is their sales elsewhere you know, fell a lot because a lot of their sales were coming from elsewhere, yet uh, there's a limited ch uh, change in local competition because few people were, were kind of uh, from other states were selling uh, 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 in them. Uh, local market. Uh, and so essentially what we're doing is we're showing that these guys who we'd expect to really be harmed are much uh, are, are worse off uh, than the guys who, who, who we'd expect uh, are, are to not suffer very much and may even gain. Uh, and indeed, we'll, we'll kind of find those relatives. Now, what would we think would happen here in aggregate here? The identification is more, more difficult. You know, typically this is swept out in the fixed effects. But you know, what we'd expect is, you know, at least if there were capacity constraints in the short run, or, 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 or at least it was very costly to massively increase output, then we'd expect kind of a big drop in sales uh, just from these imbalances. Uh, because essentially, uh, 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 you know, only if uh, kind of trade was balanced uh, uh, bilaterally in all of these cases, uh, uh, would there be kind of none of these lucky and unlucky firms. Okay, and so they're kind of real costs uh, uh, to these kind of uh, this kind of short run uh, uh, imbalances. Um, so you know, in my mind, uh, uh, that's kind of central to what we're seeing here. So you know, the other thought I had is, you know, this is really a paper about reshoring. Uh, kind of didn't make that uh, link too explicit, but, but this is you know a huge topic right now, asking about American firms who are trying to bring their manufacturing closer to home. Uh, or uh, to be less reliant on, 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 on foreign markets, et cetera. 
Uh, and so, you know, as we saw with international trade during the pandemic, we, there's a massive increase here in interstate trade costs in the short run. Uh, that's forcing firms to kind of purchase inputs locally, to sell their outputs locally. Uh, and then the trade costs subsequently declined again. You could now sell uh, uh, across borders or internationally uh, 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 more generally. Um, and many of these uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 patterns persisted to some degree. And so the way I think about this, many of these new matches that they were forming stuck. And so broadly speaking, there's three reasons this could be. Uh, one is, you know, maybe there were some fixed costs of finding new matches. And as a result of being kind of forced to do this, because my old matches I couldn't, couldn't uh, I, I, I kind of match with anymore, um, we now have more matches. We now maybe have better matches because I, I tried out some new firms and it turns out that they're actually a very good match as an input supplier or a new, a new uh, 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 outlet for me to sell my products. Um, so uh, uh, in this case, obviously, you know, the government doesn't want to subsidize this type of thing since they chose not to make those uh, uh, investments in these extra uh, 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 matches uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but, you know, productivity should be higher post-pandemic. Uh, alternatively, perhaps there are these relational contracts, uh, uh, these kind of distant ones in other states were severed, uh, and now the matches are a lot worse uh, uh, because I'm kind of losing out on a bunch of these uh, 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 relational contracts that are being held together by repeated interactions. There we'd expect productivity uh, uh, to have fallen, and this is kind of clearly a bad thing. Um, the third, which has got, gotten a lot of attention recently, is you know, maybe firms have reconsidered their supply chain. Previously, they just cared about getting, say, the cheapest uh, 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 suppliers. Now they also care about resilience. And what do we mean by resilience? We mean, you know, not being caught in a situation where you've lost a critical uh, uh, supplier. And we hear a lot of talk about this. And, uh, you know, I've been speaking to a bunch of firms recently. And, you know, this is kind of number one uh, uh, topic of discussion for them is making their supply chains more resilient. So in this case, you could think of this as they're willing to stomach worse matches. I'm, I'm willing to also buy from this local supplier who's not so good uh, or more expensive. Why am I willing to do that? Well, now if there's another shock uh, uh, that comes along, I'll be in a better position uh, 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 to not be disrupted. Uh, and in, in this case, we think it's, you know, uh, it's assuming these decisions are optimal rather than fads, uh, then we think that this is a, a, a you know, a better outcome for the firm, but we would still, you know, see uh, uh, the productivity fall. We'll only see the benefits of this uh, uh, when there is a, a, a kind of another negative uh, uh, shock. So, you know, my main suggestion here is maybe we can distinguish some of these stories and kind of, uh, you know, go more in the direction of trying to understand the impacts of this, this reshoring uh, by, you know, there's different predictions on productivity between one and two and three, they're moving in opposite directions. If they're relational contracts, the data is not ideal for this, but we should see certain types of relationships broken first, uh, uh, like the work of uh, Rocco Machiavello and co-authors. If it's about resilience, then maybe this is more going to be more common for critical inputs, less for less critical inputs. Uh, and these things seem, seem like hypotheses that, that, that uh, uh, could be tested. But kind of the main takeaway here is this is a super topical question, this reassuring, and these Indian firms may be doing, have, may, may have done this, that's why these these kind of uh, relationships have persisted while they continue to buy more uh, uh, domestically uh, and that's from abroad. And uh, um, maybe we have uh, uh, some, some, some uh, uh, insight that we can draw from that. Um, okay, there's a minor point about selected samples, which I'll, I'll pass on uh, at the Canada. So uh, let me pivot quickly and kind of talk about uh, uh, the previous paper uh, uh, that was uh, uh, excellently presented by uh, Kalyani on size-based regulations. Um, so, let me try and give a little bit of background uh, by way of motivation. So, you know, a kind of central question for people interested in misallocation and, and, and productivity and development more generally is, you know, are big firms or small firms more distorted? And obviously this matters for policymakers. Uh, governments are deciding, you know, which firms to uh, 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 kind of subsidize and which to not. And at least my prior here is that it probably is true that big firms are more distorted. If you look at the evidence of Shen Olkin that uh, uh, um, Kalyani mentions in, in, in the paper, they show that at least average products of capital are much higher in big firms, although uh, uh, they can't measure marginal products of capital. And we don't have uh, particularly good evidence uh, uh, on, on, on those. Uh, McCaig and Pouchnik show that uh, when employment in Vietnam moves from kind of smaller firms to larger firms as a result of trade, aggregate TFP uh, 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 goes up. 
And so these are kind of all suggestions that maybe indeed uh, there are, are, are larger distortions in bigger firms. Uh, and governments uh, uh, may well believe this as well. At least if you look at their subsidy programs, they typically spend much more on, on giving money to big firms than they do on giving mon money to small firms, uh, uh, sometimes order of magnitudes uh, of difference uh, there. So, you know, a puzzle here is, uh, you know, we think there's good reasons, uh, 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 good, good evidence that uh, these big firms are more distorted. But when we turn to our basic theory, we often think of small firms as more distorted, particularly when we think about credit constraints, which is, you know, maybe the kind of central distortion uh, in much of this literature, since uh, small firms typically don't have a lot of collateral, uh, and there are other reasons why, why they struggle to access uh, credit. So this is where kind of size-based regulations come in as one of the key sources why it may be the case uh, that larger funds are in fact more distorted uh, as some of the other evidence uh, 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 suggests. And as kind of central one of these distortions is on, uh, on uh, kind of labor and regulation. Uh, yet when we've looked for this, as in Amarapu and Gekta and others, um, we don't find a lot of bunching, which is a bit of a puzzle. Like if there are these size dependent distortions when we need things like that in order to to uh, uh, kind of uh, generate uh, 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 these uh, more distorted big firms, uh, but we don't find them when we look uh, 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 around these uh, um, uh, particular thresholds. So, you know, this is where this paper comes in uh, and makes uh, uh, the, uh, uh, um, the kind of, uh, 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 has the insight that, you know, it's not necessarily true that there'll be a lot of bunching. In particular, if firms are very wary of crossing this threshold, then they may start restricting employment growth well before reaching that threshold. Uh, and so we won't see uh, as much bunching at, at the threshold itself. And there's a combination here of reduced uh, uh, form work, which uh, um, went through in some detail, uh, in, in particular looking at these kind of very novel, uh, I haven't seen analyzed before, changes in state uh, 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 rules around uh, uh, where they started enforcing these labor laws uh, using a dynamic difference in difference, uh, and that nice evidence on contract labor and capital ratios. Then there's a, a very much in progress structural model. I guess the uh, updated slides were sent to me yesterday. Uh, it's extremely rich and I recommend uh, everyone uh, 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 read the paper in more detail when there's a, a kind of final version of it. Uh, and uh, as we kind of saw a glimpse of, there's a lot going on here. There are separations, there's hiring and firing systems, endogenous search intensity with convex costs, uh, capital and contract labor, et cetera. And kind of the main takeaway is you know, not only are firms slowing down their search as they approach the threshold, uh, but the reason this bunching is not occurring is because essentially, uh, if it is, uh, 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 you know, very costly to ad adjust the intensity of your search effort, you know, to change how your HR team works, for example, uh, and to kind of rush through new hires, then essentially when negative shocks hit the firm, uh, it's going to take a long time to come back uh, 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 up to the threshold, uh, and that's going to lead uh, 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 to uh, much less bunching than you would get uh, if firms can quickly adjust intensity when they're hit by these negative uh, uh, shocks. David, so, uh, yeah. for your oh. information, we have only two minutes. Um, oh, okay, so okay, so let me wrap. Let me wrap up in thirty seconds. I have some questions on on the reduced uh, 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 form results. I guess there's some question on how well you can rationalize both this kind of large change you find with the policy change uh, moving from hundred to three hundred. Uh, as well as kind of the lack uh, of the bunching uh, at 100 in the cross section. Uh, and in my mind, you know, trying to kind of uh, uh, make, write a model that's consistent with both of those is a real challenge. Uh, and I, I, I'm looking forward to kind of seeing uh, 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 the results uh, of these uh, estimates eventually. Um, okay, so I'll wrap up there uh, and we can open up to, I guess, questions. Uh, thank you very much, David, for uh, such uh, interesting and challenging uh, comments and questions. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have only two minutes. Um, in, in fact, there are no uh, questions in the chat. I, I thought a couple of questions, at least for the two first speakers, but I, I think we will not have no time. Then perhaps a very, very quick question for, uh, for Federico. Then, uh, it's, it's very clear that endogenizing the, the, the network will, will improve a lot our understanding of, of the role of, of shocks in particular to, to welfare and uh, productivity. But uh, uh, is it possible to, to state conditions under which uh, the shock will, will amplify conditions under which 
shocks will uh, contract or will reduce the, the effect of, of, of shocks? Uh, thanks, Omar. Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, that's super important. And, and we show in our, in our model that's going to depend on, on the value of the parameters that we estimate. So, you know, whether you estimate that uh, goods are substitutes or complements in the production function and so on, those type of things will affect in which direction, uh, um, whether shocks amplify, I mean, whether the production network amplifies or dampens uh, uh, the shock. So that's definitely part of the predictions of the model. Thank, thank you very much. It's a pity that uh, I think there is a lot of interesting things to debate. I will ask a very, very short question to, to Pamela, and, it, and it's about uh, policy recommendation. What will be uh, the trade off between uh, decreasing market power and increasing uh, uh, self employment? And uh, what, what uh, do you think? I think. Uh, the, um... There is, there is a, we show in the last measure factors. So it, what is important, uh, it's the way that you want to reduce uh, labor market power. What is the policy? You can attack a policy with like the labor supply. So training of uh, workers and moving them to the formal sector, reducing, trying to reduce informality. That will give you a different set of labor market outcomes than a policy that tries to, for instance, decrease the fixed cost of entry of firms. So it, 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 it's, it's targeting labor demand. I think just empirically, it's important to 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 for each of these uh, particular situations uh, um, quantify um, and, and check uh, at the end what, what will be the, the, the results in each of these policies. So that's sort of right. what we want to highlight. Okay, thank thank you very much. And then I will. Unfortunately, it's uh, four thirty uh, here in in England. Uh, I, I thank you very much all for this uh, incredibly good uh, session and uh, looking forward to see you uh, in person somewhere, somehow in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Amar. Thanks, everyone, thank you. for thank participating. You, thank you. Thank you. Bye.